Hey everyone, it's Saoirse. I know it's been a long time. I really had to recover after the Perks of Being a Wallflower video and videos. And I read a super long book after that. It is At Home by Bill Bryson. This is a short history of private life. So it took me weeks to read because I was really just like enjoying it. Um, it's over 500 pages. There's just so much in here. Y'all know by now, maybe. I love Bill Bryson so much. He's one of my favorite writers. Um, probably my favorite, my favorite travel writer, probably my favorite nonfiction writer. It's just super entertaining stuff. So, I have a lot of facts to share with you. I just want to share like my, the most interesting things that I got out of this book. So it says, with his signature wit, charm, and seemingly limitless knowledge, Bill Bryson takes us on a room-by-room -room tour through his own house, using each room as a jumping-off point into the vast history behind the domestic artifacts we take for granted. As he takes us through the history of our modern comforts, Bryson demonstrates that whatever happens in the world eventually ends up in our home, in the paint, the pipes, the pillows, and every item of furniture. So interesting. I mean, some people would find like something like this kind of a history book boring, but I was just absorbed in it. It is. It was published in 2010, just so you know. So let's just dive in because we are defi definitely going to use up our time limit here. Mm -mm -mm. And it's very like Britain and Victorian era centric, I should let you know. It's not, it doesn't really cover like the entire history of the world and homes throughout the world. Um, which kind of makes sense because he's using his his house in England to tell us all of these things. So he's talking about the um, this exhibition, the Great Exhibition, is that what it was called, um, in London, which was in 1851. Um, and they had to get somebody to like plan this thing, this crystal palace, so I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but look it up, it's really cool. It says the risks were considerable and keenly felt Yet, after only a few days of fretful hesitation, the commissioners approved Paxton's plan. Nothing, really absolutely nothing, says more about Victorian Britain and its capacity for brilliance than that the century's most daring and iconic building was entrusted to a gardener. I just think that's so cute, and it's such a beautiful place. Um, there's like a little picture in there. You have to think of how incredible this was for Victorians to see this for the first time. So here's, here's a little look at that. The Crystal Palace was at once the world's largest building and its lightest, most ethereal one. Today we are used to encountering glass in volume, but to someone living in 1851, the idea of strolling through cubic acres of airy light inside a building was dazzling, indeed giddying. The arriving visitor's first sight of the exhibition hall from afar, glinting and transparent, is really beyond our imagining. It would have seemed as delicate and evanescent, as miraculously improbable as a soap bubble. To anyone arriving at Hyde Park, the first sight of the Crystal Palace floating above the trees sparkling in sunshine would have been a moment of knee-weakening splendor. I can't, I can't even imagine. I wish I could see it. The interesting thing about the Neolithic Revolution is that it happened all over the earth, among people who could have no idea that others in distant places were doing precisely the same things. Farming was independently invented at least seven times in China, the Middle East, New Guinea, the Andes, the Amazon Basin, Mexico, and West Africa. Um, and then it goes on to tell us other things that happened at the same time, but independently. And I just find that fascinating. Like there's a lot of cases such as like electricity, um, the electric, the electric light, whatever, you name it. People in different places without talking to each other about it have come up with the same ideas. And I think, I mean, if that doesn't make you think we're all connected in our brains, then I don't know what does. The low doors of so many old European houses, on which those of us who are absent-minded tend to crack our heads, are low not because people were shorter and required less headroom in former times, as is commonly supposed. People in the distant past were not, in fact, all that small. Doors were small for the same reason windows were small. They were expensive. You ever wonder that when you look at old, old buildings and the doors and windows are really tiny? They were just expensive. I, I just love these facts. I love them so much. This is, this is so crazy to me. He's saying that people 
would move their furniture around the house. Like, rooms weren't always a thing. This wasn't a designated this or a designated, like, dining room or whatever. Rooms have evolved. Houses have evolved so much over time. People moved around the house looking for shade or sunlight and often took their furniture with them. So rooms, when they were labeled at all, were generally marked Matina for morning use or Sera for afternoon. Um, so, and this is from Italian blueprints from the time of the Renaissance. I just think that's so wild. Can you imagine picking up your couch and being like, I want to be over here because the light is in there. It's actually a brilliant idea because I kind of follow the light around my house because it's so pretty in the morning in the living room and it's so pretty like in my office in the afternoon in the kitchen. The light just comes through the windows in such a nice way. Oh yeah, you know I had to throw something about baking in here. Um, a baker who cheated his customers could be fined 10 pounds per loaf sold or made to do a month's hard labor in prison. For a time, transportation to Australia was seriously considered for malfeasant bakers. This was a matter of real concern for bakers because every loaf of bread loses weight in baking through evaporation, so it is easy to blunder accidentally. For that reason, bakers sometimes provided a little extra. The famous baker's dozen. Such a fun fact. Oh, this is so exciting. Um, people dreamed of being able to eat foods from far away or out of season, but they didn't have refrigeration. Like, refrigeration is such a new thing. So in January 1859, much of America followed eagerly as a ship laden with 300,000 juicy oranges raced under full sail from Puerto Rico to New England to show that it could be done. By the time it arrived, however, more than two-thirds of the cargo had rotted to a fragrant mush. What a pure thing, though. Everybody's just so excited about some oranges racing under full sail. I just think that's so cute. Ah, ice. They discovered ice. Oh yeah, so he's talking about how um, they actually imported ice from New England to England. And the British, they were like, what's this thing ice? You know, if, you, if you've been to the UK, if you live in the UK, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, he says, by the 1850s, most ice sold in Britain was in fact Norwegian, though it has to be said that ice never really caught on with the British. Even now, it is still often dispensed it dispensed there as if it were on prescription. The real market, it turned out, was in America itself. I love that, as if it were on prescription. I mean, it, seriously, what do you have to do to get some ice in the UK? Why? It's not that hard. Get yourself a little ice tray. Ugh, don't get me started. I lived in Scotland for a year and like, you just can't get ice. You go out to dinner and you get like a carafe of warm water for the whole table. And it's like that everywhere I've been in Europe. Why? Why do you do that to yourselves? Love ice. Oh yeah, so you know how we all love mason jars and they're so trendy and fun and I put all my like nuts and things in them? Well, here's a little thing about the guy. He patented this threaded glass jar with a metal screw on lid. It became a huge hit everywhere, but Mason himself scarcely benefited from it. He sold the rights in it for a modest sum, then turned his attention to other inventions. Float a folding life raft, case for keeping cigars fresh, a self-draining soap dish that he assumed would make him rich, but his other inventions were neither successful nor even very good. As one after another failed, Mason withdrew into a semi-demented poverty. He died alone and forgotten in a New York City tenement house in 1902. So I just want to say, I remember you, Mason. Thank you for the mason jars. It's so sad how many people, there's a lot of people in here that he says invented these things and then they died completely just penniless because they sold the patent and then nothing else worked for them and they died like completely forgotten. Why? Why is that so common? It's just sad because we don't think about these things. Like we don't think about who is Mason, who came up with the Mason jar. Somebody had to invent it. Um, oh, this is so crazy. During the war, is this World War, World War II, um, when they did like the blackouts in the UK so the enemy couldn't see lights, um, a total of 4,133 people were killed on Britain's roads during the first four months of the war just from people having to drive in the dark. People were driving with no dashboard lights, no headlights, no street lights. They were still driving, and people like pedestrians were killed all the time. Nearly three quarters of the victims were pedestrians. 
without dropping a single bomb, um, 600 people were dying a month. I just think that's, I never even thought about that, because you picture like the blackout and you picture people just in their houses, like quiet, no lights. You forget people were out on the streets driving. I just love books like this, because it's so many things I didn't think about. Ooh, this is about electricity. Um, he's talking about wall sockets. They weren't always terribly reliable. Early ones reportedly tended to crackle and smoke and sometimes shot out sparks. At one stately home in Scotland, until well into Edwardian times, it was the practice to throw cushions at one particularly lively wall outlet. Can you imagine? We are lucky in a lot of ways um, with the conveniences that we have. It's just fascinating to see throughout this book how, like, how plumbing and electricity and transportation and communication, all these things developed and to hear the like first-hand first -hand accounts from the diaries of people who lived through these times um, as things are being discovered and invented. It's just, can you imagine, like especially the 19th century? Don't get me started on the 19th century, it's so fascinating. Oh yeah, so they discovered, um, the thing about furniture in the UK, they didn't have like wood that would bend easily so all of their all of their furniture was really boxy up to a certain point and then they discovered mahogany from the caribbean and it says every chair indeed every built thing in the house seemed suddenly to have elegance and style and fluidity so they could do those like beautiful wing back chairs and curves and furniture but then of course uh, within just 50 years of its discovery, all of this wood was used up, and it's gone. Like, this this certain type of mahogany is no longer in existence. Can you believe it? Like, we as humans, we just discover something cool, and then we just decimate it. It's, future generations will never see it. It's terrible. Oh, this is so crazy. If we were to go back in time to a house in um, this whatever person's day, uh, Chippendales, who made furniture, one difference that would immediately strike us would be that chairs and other items of furniture were generally pushed up against the walls, giving every room the aspect of a waiting room. Chairs or tables in the middle of the room would have looked as out of place to Georgians as a wardrobe left in the middle of the room would look to us today. And you don't think about this stuff, but it says one reason for putting everything aside was to make it easy to walk through a room without tripping in the dark, because it was just dark all the time. I love the passages in here about like living by candlelight and um, the developments in, in lanterns and the electric light and all that. How people just, they didn't go to bed, like we think they went to bed early, like their day just ended um, when the sun went down, but it didn't. They still had stuff to do. And they just did it with strained eyeballs. It's just wild. It gets a little bit dark in here and we turn on our lights, I mean, oh, my goodness. Oh, this is so funny about the, the telephone. Before the, the phone like rang when you got a call, the only way to know if someone was trying to get through to you was to pick up the phone from time to time and see if anyone was there. There was no ring, you just, anybody trying to call me? No? Okay. It's so amazing. Oh, this is so gross. Um, he talks about pests, like household pests. This chapter really grossed me out. Uh, in one famous outbreak in 1917, the town of Lasselle in western Victoria in Australia uh, was overrun with mice after an unusually warm winter. For a short but memorably lively period, mice existed in Lasselle in such densities that every horizontal surface became a frantic mass of darting bodies. Every inanimate object writhed under a furry coating. There was nowhere to sit. Beds were unusable. The people are sleeping on tables to avoid the mice, one newspaper reported. The women are kept in a constant state of terror, and the men are kept busy preventing the mice from crawling down their coat collars. Over 1,500 tons of mice, perhaps 100 million individuals, were killed before the outbreak was defeated. I can't. I couldn't. I just, I simply couldn't. I have a lizard in my bathroom right now, and... Don't get me started. 
Oh, this is so interesting. This guy, he created landscapes that were in a sense more English than the countryside they were placed. He called it placemaking. The landscape of much of lowland England today looks timeless, but it is in a, in a large part an 18th century creation. So this guy, he was like a landscape architect. He, he created these places that we see and we think like, this is quintessentially English. Um, but a lot of it was him and I just think that's so wild. Like the, this, this country is just crafted even in its hills and um, like he would create lakes and things that weren't there before and they look so natural. Oh, this is gross. Crowded graveyards. Burial grounds grew so full that it was almost impossible to turn a spade of soil without bringing up some decaying limb or other organic relic. Bodies were buried in such shallow and cursory graves that often they were exposed by scavenging animals or rose spontaneously to the surface the way rocks do in flower beds and had to be redeposited. Mourners in cities almost never attended at graveside to witness a burial itself. This, the experience was simply too upsetting and widely held to be dangerous in addition. Oh. Oh, they said like it was like being struck with a cannonball when you would smell the escaping gases from a coffin. Um, yeah. The graveyard situation, it was not cute back then. It was not cute. And when I say back then, I'm assuming this is all like it's pretty Victorian around that time. Um, I mean, the whole book isn't, but like so much happened in that in that century like um regency georgian victorian edwardian that those eras oh this is just so sad um in the western united states almost 60 percent of all the water that comes out of taps for all purposes is sprinkled on lawns worse still are the amounts of herbicides and pesticides 70 million pounds of them a year that are soaked into lawns it is deeply ironic it is a deeply ironic fact that for most of us, keeping a handsome lawn is about the least green thing we do. And it's so sad because I would love to have grass, but I straight up don't. Like, it's just dirt, dirt and weeds and I have to mow them anyway. <laughs> He's talking about like stairs and people falling down stairs. Um, at one New York City railroad station, the stair edges had been given a non-slip covering with a pattern that made it difficult to discern the stair edge. In six weeks, more than 1,400 people fell down these stairs, at which, t at which point the problem was fixed. Absolutely ridiculous. Like, I learned a lot about stairs in this book, too, and how they're pretty much never perfect and they're always unsafe. Um, ooh, this is fascinating. Their, like, wallpaper back in the day was real poisonous. Uh, gave off a per per uh, peculiar musty smell that reminded many people of garlic. Homeowners noticed that the bedrooms with green wallpapers usually had no bed bugs. Um, so there was something about green, what they were using in the paint and the wallpaper, that were making people really, really sick. Um, I think there's like arsenic, yeah, arsenic-based pigments. Absolutely wild, the things that they got up to back then, and they had no idea. I just really feel, I feel unwell in green rooms, I don't know why. Um, oh, I loved the chapter about the bedroom, this, this might have been one of my favorites. The real problem with beds, certainly by the Victorian period, was that they were inseparable from that most troublesome of activities, sex. Within marriage, sex was of course sometimes necessary. Mary Wood Allen in the popular and influential What a Woman Ought to Know, a Young Woman Ought to Know, assured her young readers that it was permissible to take part in physical intimacies within marriage, so long as it was done without a particle of sexual desire. Why do the Victorians make things so difficult for themselves? Um, this, this American educator, Catherine Beecher, who was by the standards of the age a radical feminist, argued passionately that women should be accorded full and equal educational rights so long it was, as it was recognized that they would need extra time to do their hair. Oh, it was just so, everything's so sexist. It's so sexist. Um, so, uh, in France, a woman could divorce a man on grounds of adultery alone, though only as long as the infidelity had occurred in the marital home. In England, um, in one well-known case, a woman named Martha Robinson was for years beaten and physically misused by a cruel and unstable husband. 
Uh, he inflicted her with gonorrhea and then poisoned her almost to the point of death by slipping antivenereal powders into her food without her knowledge. Her health and spirit broken, she sued for divorce. The judge listened carefully to the arguments, then dismissed the case and sent Mrs. Robinson home with instructions to try to be more patient. Don't even get me started. Um, being a woman uh, was automatically deemed to be a pathological condition. There was a belief more or less universal that women after puberty were either ill or on the verge of being ill almost permanently. Uh, menstruation was described in medical texts as if it were a monthly act of willful negligence. It is just disgusting, the ignorance. And because of, like, modesty issues, the doctors wouldn't even, like, they couldn't study women, so they couldn't help them. And so they were often ill because they couldn't get help from doctors. The doctors wouldn't look at their female parts. It's just awful. Ooh, for, uh, this is a 1758 list of deaths, and it's kind of interesting. Choked with fat, one. Itch, two. Froze to death, two. St. Anthony's fire, four. Lethargy, four. Sore throat, five. Worms, six. Killed themselves, 30. French pox, 46. Lunatic, 72. Drowned, 109. Mortification, 154. Teeth, 644. How exactly teeth killed so many people seems bound to remain forever a mystery. I just, I just love it. What? Teeth. Teeth are such an issue. Um, oh my god, being buried alive. Eleanor Markham of upstate New York, who was about to be buried alive, or buried in July 1894, uh, anxious noises were heard coming from her coffin. The lid was lifted and Miss Markham cried out, my god, you are burying me alive. She said, I was conscious all the time you were making pre preparations to bury me. The horror of my situation is altogether beyond description. I could hear everything that was going on, even a whisper outside the door. But no matter how much she willed herself to cry out, she was powerless to utter a noise. Ugh. And then they opened this one guy's tomb when it was opened to put his widow in. The coffin of the husband was found open and empty and the skeleton discovered in a corner of the vault in a sitting posture. People were getting, up, getting buried alive just left and right all the time. It's terrible. Oh my god, and people would keep bodies because grave robbers were so common. They would sell bodies to doctors so the doctors could study them. And so people would keep their loved ones' bodies until they were rotting in the living room and babies were playing with maggots on the carpet so that grave robbers would not be able to use those bodies. It is disgusting. And then he talks about William Burke and William Hare, Irish immigrants in Edinburgh who killed at least 15 people in a period of less than a year. They were killing people to sell the bodies to doctors. And the doctors were like, okay, I'm sure, I don't know where you're getting these bodies, but all right. Um, this is, I love the bathroom chapter. What really got the Victorians to turn to bathing was the realization that it could be gloriously punishing. The Victorians had a kind of instinct for self-torment and water became a per perfect way to make that manifest. Um, one early type of shower was so ferocious that users had to don protective headgear before stepping in lest they be beaten senseless by their own plumbing. Torture bathing, what fun. Ooh, this is so gross. The Thames grew so noxious that when a tunnel being dug at Rother Heath sprang a leak, the first matter through the breach was not river water, but concentrated gases, which were ignited by the miners' lamps, putting the miners in the absurdly desperate position of trying to outrun incoming waters and clouds of burning air. There's a lot about, like, sewage and stuff in here that I find fascinating. Oh my god, this is, this is too good. This is about, this is from the chapter The Dressing Room. They're all different rooms, the chapters. The one sartorial area in which dandies did stand out, as it were, was in their trousers. Pantaloons were often worn tight as paint and were not a great deal less revealing, particularly as they were worn without underwear. The night after seeing the Count d'Orsay, Jane Carlyle noted in her diary, perhaps just a touch breathlessly, that the Count's pantaloons were skin-colored skin and fitting like a glove. The style was based on the riding trousers of Brummel's regiment. Jackets were tailored with tails in back, but were cut away in front, so that they perfectly framed the groin. It was the first time in history that men's apparel was consciously designed to be more sexy than women's. I just love tight as paint. Um, oh my god, we're running out of time. Uh, there has never been a more interesting or eventful time as the 19th century. Like, everything was changing then. Absolutely everything. Um, socially, intellectually, technologically, hygienically, sexually, everything was changing. Um, and then at the very end he talks about, you know, energy and the climate crisis and how we are pretty much destroying the world, um, but hasn't it been a fascinating ride? 
goodness wow i'm out of breath thank you so much for watching i hope some of that made sense go read some bill bryson he's super interesting and happy reading everyone i'll see you next time